In this video, I'm gonna tell you about nine lessons I have learned from being in university for nine years. And if you're asking why am I in university for nine years, because I've done four years of my bachelor's, two years of my master's, and three years for my PhD. And if you take these nine lessons and apply them to your daily life, you're gonna be an absolute superstar. You're gonna get the job you want, you're gonna live the life you want. I can guarantee it. And I know that because I applied these lessons, I had to go through them to learn them, and now I live the life that I want, and I have the job that I want. So let's get into it. So the first lesson I learned is that in life, nobody knows what they're doing. In life, everyone's going through life for the first time, and all the people who claim that they're they're experts or authority figures, why not? They are just as clueless as you. And very often the people that seem very confident and project a lot of confidence, they have self-doubt as well because they are human beings and human beings by definition are going through life for the first time. And this lesson alone turned my life from like a very stressful experience to a very fun and enjoyable experience is that at some point I decided to look at life differently. When I was much younger, I was just very serious about life and I was like, oh, I gotta get everything right and things have to work out. I was just like this ball of stress and I would push a lot of people away. I was very angry at people. I was just not a very fun person to be around. And then I decided to view life as a video game where I'm just a character in the game and all the other players here are equally new as me and no one really knows what they're doing and we're all trying to figure it out. And when you treat it like a game, you kind of remove the pressure and you remove the stress and you're like, huh, interesting. We're here and this is cool. What is that? What is that? Who's that person? Let me go talk to them. Let me go ask questions here. Oh, what's that? Let me try to achieve that goal. Like you just take on a different approach and you're just as clueless as everyone. That also removes like the hierarchy. Like in my opinion, there's no real hierarchy. Like we're all humans in a way. And just by realizing that, is gonna make a whole world of a difference. Second lesson I learned is that it's very important to choose on a mechanism of how you're gonna trust people. And in my opinion, the best way to trust someone or decide if you're gonna trust someone is to see whether they question their own beliefs and whether they're open to new ideas. In other words, to me, someone who is very trustworthy is someone who's constantly questioning their beliefs and their ideas and they're open to new beliefs and ideas. On the other hand, someone who is very stubborn and dogmatic and rigid in their way of thinking, I cannot trust that person because I am not talking to a person. I'm talking to a rigid set of ideas. In other words, that person is not really in control of themselves. Their ideas control them. And by definition, that makes them not trustworthy versus someone who is constantly changing their ideas and adopting new ideas and questioning their ideas and is using critical thinking to come to adopting certain beliefs. That person is very trustworthy because if we're all seeking the truth and truth is the goal, that person will be seeking the truth as well. And I can trust that they're going to have the critical thinking skills and the judgment to always search for the truth. And this is relevant to any like YouTuber that you watch. For example, you're watching my videos right now and you're essentially essentially trusting me with this information. And I can assure you that for at least for my channel, everything I say on my channel, every word that comes out of my mouth has been filtered and well thought out to the best of my ability in search for the truth. Now, obviously you need to use your own critical thinking and reasonability and analysis to come to your own conclusions. But in my opinion, we should trust people who are open to challenge their own beliefs. Otherwise you should run away. Third lesson I learned is you should only take advice from people who have the results you want in that domain. For example, if you have a friend who has never opened a business before and you go and say, hey, I want to open a business. What do you think? That's literally like the worst thing you can ever do. Or if you can go to someone who has never studied engineering or gone through engineering and you say, hey, I want to get an engineering degree. What do you think? That's the worst thing you can do. Instead, you should go to the experts in that domain for advice. For example, if you have a friend who has gone through engineering training, you should ask them. Now, one sample is not enough. You should ideally ask many people. You should find multiple engineers and ask them. You should find one person who's making videos about engineering, find someone else who's like studied it, someone else who's doing it right now, someone else who like knows someone who's studying engineering and just get their perspectives, but get results from people who are actually doing the thing that you're trying to do. And ideally, not only they're doing it, they're doing it and they're kicking ass. Like if you go ask a miserable engineering student about advice for engineering, it could be their work ethic, could be other stuff that is going on in their life that's clouding their judgment. That's not a great person to ask for questions. And this is a skill that I've developed very, very well that has served me very, very well is I very quickly understand who is good at what and what can I ask them. For example, my PhD advisor is excellent at doing research, at coming up with ideas, at writing papers, at publishing papers. So anything in the research domain, I go to him hands down. But if anything is relating to like the business domain, I'm probably not gonna go to him. I'm gonna go to my other friends or people I know who have a very successful business and that is their single focus because that's the thing they have spent more time doing and they actually have the result in that domain that I want. However, also on that note, I'm not gonna say totally disregard like any advice from people who have not gotten the results you want, but just make sure you run through these, like run the advice through your own critical thinking. That's very important. So I could go and ask my brother or my sister or my parents uh, something that they're not very knowledgeable about, but probably because they know me very well, they may give me some good insight, but I just have to be very careful with my filters and not take any advice on face value and just always question it and run it through my own filters, my own reasoning. Fourth lesson I learned is that in life, life is not fair. Life has a lot of talented people, obsessive people. And if you're not talented or obsessive about the thing that you're competing with someone else, you're just gonna have to try something different. And that's just the reality of the situation. And I'll give you a very simple example. And the example is Elon Musk. For example, Elon Musk, someone who's very talented and obsessed 
obsessive about solving problems, about engineering, about business. And he crushes a lot of the other people in the business domain because of his obsessiveness and because of the way his brain works. And a lot of that is attributed to talent and the way he was brought up. Obviously, he worked very hard. He worked super, super hard. But even his hard work, the fact that he's working very hard is attributed to that obsessiveness. Now, if you're going to compete against someone like Elon Musk, you're just going to have to accept that you might have to try different things. And I'll give you a very good example because I, when I was in engineering and I was taking my first class, I did not have a very strong math background because when I was in high school, I didn't really care about my math science classes. I was just kind of playing sports, talking to people and, and doing filming and doing other things that were more fun to me at the time. So in my first year, I really struggled and there were other students in the classes who were like very talented at math, very good, have gone through the rigorous training, have done every single like homework assignment in like their high school. And I was basically up against these people. But I knew that in order for me to beat them, I had to try something different. And I did. I basically went and I asked a lot of people for help. I made a group friend for people to study together and we did the math homework together. I went to the teaching assistant, asked them for help. I went to the professor, asked them for help. I basically went and attacked it at many different angles. And at the end, I would end up getting higher grades than these people. And a big part of that is because I accepted the situation for what it is. I accepted these people are probably more talented than me in that domain, but I'm talented in other domains. So I'm going to use my other skills to attack the problem from different angles. That's why in this channel, I talk a lot about self-awareness. It's very important that you know yourself very well and you know what you're good at and you know what you're not good at. That will take you a very long way. All right, lesson number five is that you're going to die soon. And no, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm being very serious. Life will go by in a blink. I mean, as of the time I'm recording this, I'm 26 years old. And I can remember when I was just 17, I was just 11 years old and life goes by fast. And the older you get, life goes by much faster and boom, soon enough, you're dead. And the fact that you're going to die very soon should basically give you a lot of insight on what you actually want to do with your life. And it's something I learned from Steve Jobs, which I have a poster of somewhere in the back. There it is. And there's a reason that the Steve Jobs poster exists over there is because even though I do love Steve Jobs and I do like a lot of the ideas that he worked on, thinking about him reminds me that I'm going to die very soon. And when you think that you're going to die very soon and like that's it, life as we know it ends. And regardless of whether you believe in an afterlife or whatever you believe happens afterwards, like independent of that, let's say this finite life that we know is very important to think about the fact that you're going to die very soon because that's going to actually show you what's important. And basically thinking in this framework will allow you to do things that you're going to be less likely to regret later on. And this is something I also learned from Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos uses a regret minimization framework. He made decisions when he was starting Amazon, his company, he thought, what would the 80 year old version of me regret less? And he went with that decision. And this is how I make decisions as well. I basically think to myself in the future in the near future and the far future. And I say, what am I likely going to regret less? And very often it's the painful, annoying thing, the hard thing that we don't want to do that we put off that we really need to do. But the moment you start framing it in terms of the fact that you're going to die soon and that you've got to do this thing or otherwise you're probably going to regret it. It makes it much easier to take action on the thing that you've been procrastinating. And that could be many things, whether it's starting a company, pursuing a degree, telling someone you really care about them and you love them, asking someone out, going out with someone, like hitting up some friend you haven't talked to in a very long time, apologizing to someone, spending more time with your family. I don't care what it is, but whatever it is that you're going to think about, like when you're going to be on your deathbed, looking back on your life and thinking, hmm, like I'm very glad I did that. Like these are the things you should be spending a lot of time doing. And again, that's just how I see it. That's how Steve Jobs sees it. That's how Jeff Bezos sees it. Obviously in life, there's no playbook. There's no manual. So you can do whatever you want, but this is just based on my experience. All right. Lesson number six is that faith is the secret sauce, to consistent action. And this is something I learned from studying the biographies of many people, especially top entrepreneurs, like again, Steve Jobs, Phil Knight, who started Nike and Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. A lot of people that I really studied in depth very often have one thing in common is that they have some element of faith. They have some element of I'm going to do this thing and I have no idea how it's going to work out, but I just trust that it will work out. There's like some trust of some external force. If you're religious, you can think of that as God. If you're from California, you can think of that as like the universe or whatever. Obviously, it's a joke, but it's like more like you have to have faith in something external that's aiding you. And I, I'm a big believer in that as well, because we as humans, we ended up on this planet. We ended up as conscious beings in this life and we have no idea why we're here. We have no idea how we ended up here. And it just makes a lot of sense that there's probably other stuff that we don't know, a lot of stuff that we cannot see. And it's actually something that really frustrates me about like people who claim to have scientific thinking is that they think only in terms of cause and effect. I think that's good. But also scientific method is based on an observation. And if something we do not observe, we should be open to the fact that it still exists. And one of these things is like faith. That's kind of more of a spiritual slash physics, metaphysical discussion, but more on a psychological basis. And this, for example, what Phil Knight would talk about when he wrote Shoe Dog, uh, where he's documenting his progress with Nike. He says, have faith in faith. Just psychologically having the faith that things will work out will increase the odds of things working out because you're going to take action in the direction of things working out. And that's probably going to make all the difference. So again, two different angles to think about it, but it doesn't matter. In both cases, I think faith is very important. All right, lesson number seven is that people are the single most determinant factor of your quality of life. And I know this because I've done experiments where when I was in high school, I was very social. I was very 
happy. When I was in college, I was very social, I was very happy. When I was traveling around the world, I was doing it with friends, I was very social, I was very happy. And yes, there would be moments where I would go in solitude and kind of like lately I've been spending a lot of time alone just because I'm trying to build things online. I'm trying to do a lot of things, kind of reflect on what I want to do with my life. But I noticed that my happiness has always been correlated with the quality of the people that I hang out with. And I don't care if you're introverted. I don't care if you claim to hate people or any of that. Us humans, we are social creatures. We are wired to have connections. Things, chemicals, serotonin and other things release in your brain when you see other people, especially if it's people that you like. And when you start to think in terms of people and that influences the decisions you make, for example, what kind of job you get. For example, when I would go and apply for jobs or I want to go try to work on something, the only thing I would really look at or the main thing I would look at is the type of people working on it because these are the people I'm going to be spending time with. I'm going to ask them questions. We're going to interact when not. If the people suck and are boring and are like just mean and miserable, I don't want to be there. If people are very happy, optimistic and serious and just kind of are all about learning. Then yes, of course, I want to be there. I don't even care what the project is about. I want to be around these people. And again, this is something Elon Musk has learned and done very well because I've been inside SpaceX and the people there were amazing. And one thing Elon Musk does is he only attracts, tries to attract or his recruiters try to attract the best of the best of the best and people who are like really obsessed in their domains and they put them together. And the very fact that you're working with amazing people will make you want to do that job and do it very well, even if you're going to get a pay cut. So in anything you do, my advice would be to try to serve people, try to meet amazing people and just keep in mind that people are the most important thing. Lesson number eight I have learned is that the best way to receive is to give. And I know it sounds very cliche. You probably heard this before, but it's so true. And I had to learn it from experience and you have to basically be so good at giving and just give, 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 give and give so much. And then you might receive something and be okay with that. And again, from like a life living perspective, if you were to live life from the question of like, what can I give rather than most people don't do this. Most people are like, what can I take? What can I get? What can I receive? And that's all they think about all day. And they only think about haggling and taking things from people. But if you have a more abundant mindset of like, I have so much knowledge and talents and energy and love that I want to give out to the universe, give out to other people and go help people. How can I give as much as I can? And you start thinking in that framework, ironically, you're going to start receiving way more than you can handle. And this is why I really focus on skills and focus on developing skills and just becoming someone who is valuable and, and productive and contributes well to society, because that gives you the capacity to give more and give more quality things. And again, by doing that, you'll receive whatever you want. And the ninth and last lesson, which is probably the single most important one and the most important advice I have for you is something I actually also learned from Elon Musk, which is be rigorous in your self analysis. And what that means is do not fool yourself. So this is something I learned from Richard Feynman. So basically combining what I learned from Elon Musk and Richard Feynman and what I have thought about very deeply is there's a quote by Richard Feynman, which is very good. It says the first rule is that you cannot fool anyone. And the easiest person to fool is yourself. And I notice this all the time. A lot of people out there are just fooling themselves. They're lying to themselves. They're not living at they're not facing the truth. And you have to face the truth. And you have to be very rigorous in your self analysis. And you have to be very data driven and scientific in how you look at yourself and judge yourself. And there's a very simple reason for that is that without like having a very honest look in the mirror, how can you possibly change the things that you're doing wrong or the things that you don't like doing? And for example, one thing I started doing lately is I track every single hour of my day, literally like in the middle of the day. And at the end of the night, I literally go, I have a calendar and I populate it. What did I actually do today? Hour by hour. And I color code them and I explain why I was doing it and what I'm thinking of during that time. And then at the end of the week, what I do is I take a look at the whole week and I spend at least an hour, maybe sometimes two hours, literally just looking at how I spent the week and how each hour went and why and why I made this decision and why this happened. And this level of this rigor and me analyzing why I'm doing the things I'm doing gives me such great insight on why I am doing something and whether I want to keep doing it or stop doing it, whether I want to double down on it or whether I don't want to do it anymore. And it's probably the single most important habit I have, because again, having like a hyper self aware lifestyle where you're just constantly aware of what's going on, why you're doing it, why you're not doing it allows you to like immediately catch something that's not going well, and then correct it. Or likewise, when something is going well, and you're aware that it's going well, you double down on it, and you press hard on the gas pedal, and you capitalize on opportunities. And that's just so important. Now, in order to have this rigor in your self analysis, you first need to remove a lot of noise, and you need to clear a lot of stuff that's distracting you and draining your attention, you really need to focus your attention on one or two things at a time and basically be able to execute on them. And that just means like eliminating a lot of other stuff. And I made a separate video on the type of things that I do more specifically stay productive and you should go ahead and watch it. You're probably going to learn a ton there. Peace, love.